Hi, my name is Liz Hunter and I'm the CEO of Westgate Health Cooperative. I'm delighted to welcome you to the Community Mental Health Forum on Adolescent Mental Health in a Global Pandemic. I would like to open this forum by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands, the many lands upon which we are meeting today, who sustained healthy communities and wisely managed these lands for thousands of years. We pay respect to the elders past, present and emerging as we at Westgate Health Community are, remain committed to shaping a future in which all will thrive. I'd also like to extend a warm welcome to any First Nations people who are joining our forum this evening, either in person or online. Westgate Health has a long proud history as a not-for-profit member-owned cooperative that provides excellent affordable health services to its members. Located in South Kingsville and Newport, we have been here for around 40 years. We provide GP and allied health services in a caring, compassionate, patient-centred setting. And as a not-for-profit, all our profits go back into caring for our community. We are always on the lookout for any clinicians who would like to partner with us to provide services in our flexible and supportive work environment. So if that's something that is of interest to you, please reach out to us after the forum, either through our website or by giving us a call. As a not-for-profit cooperative, we are a voice and a community leader when it comes to primary health. Last year, we received a generous grant from Westgate Neighbourhood Fund to run this series of community mental health forums. Our last forum focused on the impact of the pandemic generally on mental health across the population. Tonight, we're talking about something that's probably close to all of us in one way or another, and that is the impact of the pandemic that it has, has had on the mental health of adolescents and young people. We're incredibly grateful to Westgate Neighbourhood Fund for their generous donation, which made it all possible. And we specifically extend our thanks to Minister Melissa Horn for her ongoing interest in and support for both this program and our cooperative. We're delighted to have Dr Ben Chia as our facilitator. I would like to welcome our panellists this evening and Ben will introduce them to you shortly and also to welcome you, our guests, both the people who are here in person and for those of you who are joining us online tonight. This forum is for you, our participants, so we really encourage you to ask your questions today, either in person or via the question and answer function if you're online. That is on the right-hand side of your screen and then when we come to the panel discussion, we will ask your questions. I would also like to acknowledge the amazing artwork by the children of Williamstown Primary School, who together created this college for Anzac Day. Those of us who are in person are gathered at the Spotswood RSL, so this truly is a community event. For some housekeeping, if you're watching online and you have any te technical difficulties, please refresh your page um, or you can chat to our events team via the tech support button on the bottom right hand side of your screen. For people who are in the room, uh, we do have some refreshments. Uh, please feel free to help yourselves as you wish, especially if you have driven across town and already we've heard a couple of stories of horrendous traffic. Welcome to Melbourne West. And we also have the bathrooms which are out to your left and left down the hallway. Uh, in the case of an emergency, exits are where you came in and also at the rear of the building. Thank you so much for attending this evening. I hope you feel very welcome and take away information and inspiration that will benefit you and your family and your community as we all seek to increase community health and wellbeing. Hi, my name is Melissa Horn. I'm the state member for Williamstown. It's terrific to be able to support Westgate Health Cooperatives uh, Community Health Forums. They're focusing, they've been recipients of Westgate Tunnel Partnership Program grants, and they're doing a series of mental health forums in it, focusing on people's mental health in a global pandemic. They're being held out of Spotswood Kingsville RSL, which is a great partnership in itself. 
So I'd really like to commend everyone who's been involved to get these importance forums up and running and encourage anyone who would like to, to participate in it. Westgate Health Cooperative is a not-for-profit community health um, organisation that's been around for around 40 years. The project that we're about to launch into is a community mental health project. And we see this as an opportunity to meet the needs of many people in the community by empowering them to uh, find their own way through the mental health system. Mental health has always been a common theme for GPs in terms of people who they're dealing with. During the pandemic, all the mental health problems that people have had have got greater and more intense and what can we do to help people to find their way through this, to be able to access resources that are there um, and to do this in a community collaborative way of itself is bringing people together and some of that networking, some of that people working together, problem solving together is of itself going to be helping people find their way through this. We're a really diverse community and, um, and it's an opportunity for people to have their needs met where they're at and that's what we see as being hugely uh, beneficial because that's, um, it's not one size fits all and that's a challenge for our GPs as they work their way or guide people through the system as to you know, what's best going to meet their needs. So we couldn't have done this without um, the funding and we're just so thrilled that we actually are now being able to get funding that we can put this program on, run face-to-face -face sessions for the community. It's a game changer for us. We just simply would not be here having this conversation if it had not been for the grant that we received from Westgate Neighbourhood Fund. Welcome everyone to tonight's forum um, and I'm really excited to be um, joined by our three expert speakers to discuss um, adolescent mental health and we're going to be talking about adolescent mental health in general and in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, firstly, I think it's helpful to get a sense of what normal adolescence uh, encompasses. Um, the noun adolescence comes from the Latin word adolescere, which means to ripen or to grow up. So that's what adolescence is, the period of transition into young adulthood. So let's face it, normal adolescence is it's quite bizarre, I think. Um, it's, it's not easy to understand, I don't think. So it's a time when old patterns are gradually given up. Um, and hopefully the deep patterns of safety that have been learned from caregivers stay, but new patterns arise. So it's a time of constant change and experimentation. I think uh, those that have uh, parented adolescents will be familiar that response to discipline is one of the things that changes first. So things like challenging authority figures and limit setting, for example, going to bed later, not cleaning their room or arriving home late. Um, changing diet, starting to eat out of home with their friends. Um, so in other words, they start self-regulating rather than relying on parents to tell them when to eat and sleep, among other things. So that's the challenge for families, to support adolescents to transition from childhood to adulthood. And this is complicated even in normal circumstances with every relationship in the family in transition. And then COVID comes along and things that might have been seen as maybe quirky behaviour or result in an argument now become uh, like a pressure cooker environment under the, the lockdowns that we experienced. So I'm very excited to facilitate this forum with our three wonderful speakers. They will each give you an insight that you won't be able to get from anywhere else from their clinical practice and their theoretical knowledge and experience. As Liz said, we really encourage questions and don't, don't wait until um, the discussion starts. You can start putting questions in the Slido and questions stimu will stimulate other questions. Um, so now I'd like to uh, introduce our first speaker, who's Dr. Claire Cody. Uh, she's a child and adolescent psychiatrist and director at the Village Family Mental Health Specialists locally in Newport, where she con conducts her private practice. 
She also works at Sunshine Hospital and the Joan Kerner's Women's and Children's Hospital in the new Child and Adolescent Consultation and Liaison Psychiatry team. Prior to this, Claire held appointments at the Royal Children's Hospital and Monash Health in high acuity community mental health teams. Claire has a particular interest in adolescent psychotherapy as well as in teaching, training, supervision and service provision. Thanks, Claire. Thanks, Ben. And thanks, everyone. Um, I'm going to start with an acknowledgement. And I'm going to start by saying that to acknowledge is to accept a truth, to speak truth and recognise something as important. And I'm defining that because I'm going to talk a fair bit about acknowledgement in the next 25 minutes or so. Because in my work, acknowledgement, speaking truth, recognising importance of something is validation and validation is towards healing. So with this in mind, I wish to acknowledge the traditional owners of this land, the Yalakut, Willem and, Burung, and Boon Wurrung people, pay respect to elders of these nations. Importantly, I also want uh, in a talk about young people uh, to pay respect to the future leaders of those communities. This will always be First Nations land and sovereignty was never ceded. So in some more acknowledgements, do we need to acknowledge that young people did experience mental health difficulties at greater rates in the pandemic? So I'll start with some stats on that. There was about a 40% decrease in all presentations of children and adolescents to emergency departments in uh, stay at home periods in all health presentations. However, at the same time period, there was a 50% increase in mental health presentations of children and adolescents to emergency departments uh, compared to those periods in, uh, prior to COVID. So what was being seen in the emergency departments? Well, eating disorders skyrocketed. The RCH has had a three-fold increase in referrals for eating disorders in the last year. Rates of first episode psychosis have also increased. Um, I couldn't find the stats for Victoria, but that is actually worldwide. And a study in UK found that there's been about a 30% increase in first episode psychosis rates. Depression diagnoses in adolescents increased. Actual suicide rates fell, but presentations to emergency departments for suicidal thought and self-harm increased. There were increases every year in that statistic um, over the past 10 years by about 8% per annum. But this rate accelerated to 20% per annum, which was sustained over the last two years. But by the final lockdown in Victoria, in our, uh, in our um, emergency departments, that rate had increased to 70% increase. Mental health admissions of teenagers to hospital increased in Victoria by 47% without there being an increase in the number of adolescent hospital beds available. So why? Why were young people in such distress during this period? And I think this is where we have to start some wondering about the answers to that. And I'm going to draw on my clinical experience, but first of all, I'm going to draw on a little bit more of what Ben was talking about, about what adolescence is. I, I think the answer might be in some of the developmental tasks that young people need to face. And if I just go through these, I want you to consider for each one what the impact of stay-at-home orders and homeschooling might have been. So, a very primary task of adolescence, and in that I mean the period of time, I, I refer to teens in this talk, I refer to young people, I refer to adolescents, I'm talking about the period of time of becoming an adult, which is a little broader than just turning 18, of course. Um, so the tasks are to individuate from your family as your own person by the end of this process, where you have shared experience and culture with your family, but you have your own values and you have your own future. 
So adolescents need to be able to step when they're feeling uncertain into the relationship with their parents a little more deeply and then step away again. It's that safe base that's this actually fairly fairly an extension of the safe base of infancy. Adolescents do it differently. They go out, they explore the world, they need to retreat a little and have the family again, but they need to go out again. Um, they need to broaden their world and their horizons and they need to feel safe with separateness. They need to be able to know what it is to be a little bit vulnerable and work out what to do. Even more so than as an individual and in order to become that individual one day, Adolescents also need to find a tribe. They need to experience themselves as part of a formative friendship group and they need to journey with that tribe. Even maybe learn how to switch and evolve tribes when they need to. They need to learn the skills that that involves. Teenage friends are the people who resonate with you and continue, continue in that period to help you define who you are as you step away from your primary finding relationships as being with family. And so you need to have the experience of sharing ideas, both in the formality of a classroom and those ideas that are shared without adult ears around in that tribe as well. One of the tasks of adolescence is to come of age. There are rituals in every culture around this. It is marked with milestones. It is marked with points of reflection and celebration that is shared with your family and your peers you're journeying with. And you also, during adolescence, need to adjust to new physical and mental states of yourself. This is best done alongside a peer group of people experiencing all those same adaptions, cognitive adaptions, physical adaptions, sexual adaptions, a growing sense of a unified identity through changes that are occurring to you and the people around you and a linked shared experience of this. So I think when we think through those developmental tasks, we need to make another point of acknowledgement, highlighting something as important, which is that due to the developmental impact of when life changed so much and the pandemic hit, adolescents actually suffered what I believe to be an unequal burden compared to children and compared to adults. So thinking about that, what was it to be an adult through the pandemic? Well, our challenge, I believe, was the burden of change because we're actually far less adaptable than adolescents and we don't do change quite as well as they do. Um, adolescents are actually primed to be adaptable. We suffered the burden of change combined with responsibility. So unpredictability of the situations we faced and many adult responsibilities being kind of linked like dominoes and a lot of us waited for that first one to topple. Many of us felt like we lived in fear of the cascade that might happen. Will my business survive? Will I keep my job? Will I still have friends after this? Are my parents gonna be okay through this? Are the kids gonna be okay through this? What does my boss think of these homeschooling interruptions? And then the big one, am I gonna have toilet paper next week? <laughs> Whereas younger children, they're defined by their family and their nurturing attachments. They need to explore and process their world through feeling safe and through play. So definitely there were impacts for smaller children. But I actually believe that in healthy family environments and with some homeschooling, they did okay. Um, I think that it is important to say, however, that I was seeing in both public and private practice um, presentations of things that I would normally see in mid-adolescence now happening in the primary school years. So there was a shift towards more serious mental illness of presentations I wouldn't normally see. But far and away, it was the teenagers who I felt were suffering in my practice. I also think that we have to say homeschooling in particular, learning is not meant to be self-led for young people. Uh, even good students fell away from education to some degree during COVID. And for some students, they fell away completely. Neither school or friendships are meant to be solely online. Some teenagers I was seeing spent 24 hours a day in a single room. They had the curtains drawn. They weren't rising to bed, from bed to socialise. They weren't rising from bed to go to school. They ate when they were hungry. They slept when they were tired in fits and spurts. 
That's not a normal life. I'd say that's a recipe for depression. The people teenagers were trapped in the house with weren't exactly living their best lives either. We were stressed and overburdened parents, trying to work from home, homeschool younger children. And sometimes adults weren't just stressed, they were actually not okay. Rates of family violence increased in COVID and people couldn't necessarily get help. And the trauma some young people suffered in their homes was in some cases, in my practice, reported to me after COVID lockdowns had ended because that's when abusive parents were out of the house again, when young, person were able to see, young people were able to see me face to face and it felt safe to talk again. Now, I might sound at this point like I'm pretty critical of the fact that we endured lockdowns. But to say that young people have suffered in lockdowns is not akin to saying that these shouldn't have happened. Had young people instead been dealing with greater fears for their own safety or death of many people that they know, we would have had a different reason for psychological suffering. In speaking actually with um, an Australian-born colleague who works, uh, sorry, a non-Australian-born colleague who works here in Melbourne, I came to appreciate that without social structures that support supported the lockdowns that we had, life had to go on in some countries without them. And it was normal in some people's home countries to lose many family members. And in the case of my colleague, it was both their parents. So to say that young people have suffered in lockdown and that their developmental tasks have been disrupted and that they have suffered greater rates of mental illness is an acknowledgement, but it is not a criticism of anyone. It's important to know that some young people also did just fine. Even the particular burden experienced by young people in the pandemic was in self unequally shared. Those with pre-existing mental illness suffered more. Those with neurodiversity had different experiences again. Um, some of the kids on the autism spectrum that I saw were actually living their absolute best life. Um, there was no sensory overwhelm, there was no social overwhelm, far less transition related activity was expected of them. But then there were others who had fallen away from education from their social life that they'd worked so hard on having, their therapy ceased when they couldn't do telehealth, their routines fell away, their sleep deteriorated, and it was terrible. So in general, I think teens who did well in the pandemic were likely to be those who were a bit more resilient going into it. So anyone with previous trauma, a history of anxiety, a history of depression, neurodiversity, just a more sensitive temperament, they might have been the people who found the constant change, unpredictability and the confinement even harder. So I'm going to elaborate a little bit on what I mean by resilient because I think it's a misused concept sometimes. It is not stoicism. It's possibly the exact opposite of stoicism. Resilience is often linked in an analogy to a palm tree. Um, I think gum trees, on the other hand, are a really good example of stoicism. A gum tree looks really big and strong, but big storms come along and they stay rigid and then they break and they lose limbs, whereas palm trees are flexible. They survive a hurricane and come out the other side, but they don't do it by staying rigid. They do it by swaying around like nobody's business when the storm's actually happening. So I think that teenagers who express feelings, adapt expe adapted expectations, um, expected things uh, perhaps less or, or at least something different from themselves and from others and from their educations. They reshifted their ideas about school, self-care, friendship, even how to have fun to suit the climate that they were in. Um, and then they held on to a belief that they could be like that palm tree and straighten their life out again when all this was over, they're the lucky ones because they tended to do better. And I say lucky because resilience is not just a state of mind for the choosing. It has a lot to do with personality traits and life experiences. So it's dampened significantly by things that aren't in anyone's control. And that's where people might need extra support. So what did I actually see in my clinical practice in those young people who were struggling? Lots of disconnection, lots of emptiness feelings, teenagers who were lonely, stuck without a tribe and a purpose, their purpose being to individuate. They were feeling shut down and despondent. Nothing felt good anymore. Self-care deteriorated. They overslept by day, stayed up at night, slept poorly in general, felt irritable, then felt guilty, 
felt misunderstood, which led to fights with family who were trying to get them to eat a meal or join them for a walk. The fights led them to feel irritable and more guilty and more misunderstood. They felt pressure from adults in their life to tune into class, to complete work, to get out of bed, to stop gaming, to get off social media, to leave the house, just to have a shower, all reasonable things, but it was a lot. And none of it felt like it actually mattered or had any meaning to that young person. And then life doesn't feel like it's worth living. So usually if I'm seeing a young person in this situation, the situation being clinical depression, what I just described, by the way, enters into a treatment path with me of trying to build a relationship that's based on some consistency and trust where we start exploring patterns, ideas, what their values are, what future we might be able to kind of work out together that they could have or at least think about that feels wanted, feels attainable. We focus on the here and now. We look for times that feel slightly better. Um, we look for daily rhythms that support their health. We work on reconnection, back to school, into their social world, into activity, finding meaning in small pleasures, in achievements. We validate what's hard. We help communicate with those who need to understand what's going on for them. So in lockdown periods, apart perhaps from validating what's hard, everything else on that list was quite a lot harder to achieve as someone treating young people. So the young people I saw stayed in suspended animation. They were waiting for life to start again, but some weren't sure if they wanted it to. I need to mention also that for those young people that I was seeing, at least there was a mental health professional involved in their care. Because attempting to access mental health care during the pandemic became awfully difficult. In my clinic, there are five child and adolescent psychiatrists, but we all work only one or two days a week in private and the rest of our time in public services. We're all full. We're trying to find ways to make space to see new referrals where we can, but many of the young people we see had, have been in holding patterns where it wasn't actually clinically indicated for us to stop seeing them during the past two years like we normally might have a little bit more turnover. So when we're getting 10 plus new referrals of teenagers a week, clearly most of them couldn't be taken on which was an awful feeling when I knew what teenagers were going through from the ones I was already seeing. And in that situation where perhaps people can join wait lists or perhaps there are lengthy waits for those first appointments, I, none of us had the ability to give any level of intensity or case management within our already full books. Uh, we couldn't take on even the same level of risk and complexity that we might normally be able to take on as a new client because we were already taking on clients on top of being already full. So on the other hand, in my public practice, I've watched acuity go up and up and up over the years in terms of what the public service can see. But in the last two years, it just took a whole new leap of how acute and how unwell somebody had to be to even get service. So the gap what people can access in private, what people can access in public just became a lot wider. And I don't know that we even have the staff to fill that gap anymore in the workforce. So that's not a quick fix. However, I don't want to be pessimistic and I would say think laterally. School counsellor supports, group programs at Headspace while waiting individual service, family support workers, your GPs, getting mental health care, poor GPs, by the way, I think they just held so much, but getting mental health care plans still being the best plan, but I don't want to just say go and get a mental health care plan. It's not so easy, I know. As mental health professionals, we are working our butts off to do we can, what we can <laughs> to start seeing new people uh, and take on new referrals. And we are having to channel our own inner palm trees and flex our expectations a little as well. So I want to end with another acknowledgement. And that's that the voices of our panellists today are not the lived experience of young people surviving the pandemic with mental health challenges. But to hear that really well represented, I'd highly recommend a recent podcast series from The Age and the Sydney Morning Herald called Enough. Um, there are many interviews and stories with young people that highlight lived, 
lived experience perspectives. Um, I listened on Spotify, found it really moving. But I'm also really pleased to think that as a society, we're now so much more capable of talking openly about mental health struggles, that we're here now doing this and talking about it today, that that podcast is being listened to by many people. Um, as a medical student a million years ago, I did a mental health promotion activity about a website um, with information for teenagers if they think their friends are depressed or suicidal. And we made flyers for this website and we were contacting school leadership teams asking permission to give out these flyers to students. And I had not one, many schools tell me that they thought this was in really poor taste um, or that it might be dangerous to be talking about mental health problems with young people. So I would say, final word, it's not dangerous to talk about mental health problems with young people. It's as healthy as talking about how to take, how, uh, to, sorry, to talk about taking care of your mental health is as healthy as talking about healthy eating or healthy decision making at a party. A teenager who is safe is connected and they can talk about their world. So let's acknowledge the hardships of our teens and give them the opportunities for growth and connection and healing through talking with them now. Services will be needed and let's stay vigilant for the advocacy for that. And remember, young people are amazingly adaptable and as a group, they have been battered by this storm, but I think the majority have already and will find their ways to negotiating these tasks of adolescence by flexing their expectations and playing a bit of catch up but let's be, look out, let's be on the lookout for those who are vulnerable, who haven't weathered the storm well, and give them the support they need to reconnect. Thanks. Thanks so much, Claire, for that honest insight into what um, adolescents were going through um, during the pandemic. I'm sure everyone got a lot out of that talk and look forward to talking more about it. Now I'd like to um, introduce our next speaker, Dr. Jacinta Bleeser, who is a clinical psychologist and has over 30 years experience working in various positions in government, NGOs, public hospitals and academia. I met Jacinta when we were both working at the Alfred Child and Youth Mental Health Service and we collaborate on working with several patients. Jacinta now works full time in her private practice with patients and supervisees. I mentioned supervision in Claire's introduction as well, and I probably should um, explain a bit about what that is. So um, mental health professionals who are, um, I guess, in, in development, and we're all developing all the time, but um, we'll often seek the um, mentorship of a more senior colleague, and that's what we call supervision. So. Um, Getting back to Jacinta, she has experience working with children, adolescents and families, parents, groups and individual adults. She draws psychodynamic developmental systems and cognitive behavioural theories in her work with patients and supervisees. Welcome Jacinta. Thank you, Ben. And thank you for the invitation to share in this rich discussion tonight. Do you remember what you felt in March 2020 when we heard international borders were closed, that the Grand Prix was cancelled as people queued at the track? Because there was a global pandemic, coronavirus, COVID-19, new words swamped the news and entered our lexicon. I noticed parents in shock, disbelief, confused, in denial, carrying on regardless, scared or even terrified, very worried, what does this mean? What do I need to do? Will we have income? How will the children learn, continue their relationships? Worry about loved ones dying, especially elderly or vulnerable people if they became ill with this novel virus. I saw many parents very, very stressed. So much adaptation was and still is required in this time of great, uncertain great uncertainty in human history. There were times of feeling utterly overwhelmed. In my observation, parents responded in different ways or a number of ways at different times. 
Some jumped into action, organising, fixing, doing. Others were paralysed or sought retreat into something familiar. Some sought information, lots of information, in an effort to know. It's so hard to sit with not knowing, with uncertainty. I noticed parents distressed about injustices. Some blamed or protested to authorities or schools. Of course, each parent's responses to the start of the pandemic and then to rolling lockdowns and associated stresses is unique. But the extra demands for most were plain to see. Finding space in the house for everyone to participate in their work or study. Securing computers, headphones, bandwidth, as well as day-to-day -day demands to adjust, meal preparation, shopping, mask, masks, lots of jobs. Pivot, we were told, more, more, more. Financial stress, increasing caring responsibilities, including helping their adolescents make sense of living in confinement and to adapt. I heard parents express deep distress as they mourned their, their teenagers and young, young adults missed milestones and or imagined opportunities. Some worried deeply that those losses might deprive or even damage their child or children. Some parents were relieved that their teenager difficult to rein in and at risk of the perils of too much freedom, were compelled by law to restrict their movements and interactions. Some parents reflected on the advantages of slowing family life down, the benefits of time to pay attention, to listen, to hang out together instead of a life cluttered with activities. Even a pandemic doesn't stop the developmental thrusts within adolescence, as Claire has described. It is still a job of teenagers and young people to test their values, ideas, beliefs, first gained as children within their families, now with reference to their peers. The task is to explore, what do I think, believe, want, need, aspire to? Who am I? What does my mind think value? How, how am I the same or different to my family? How do I belong or attach to my peers and remain within my family? Similarly, the job of parents hasn't changed. Adolescents still need their parents to scaffold their explorations with their peers out in the world as they negotiate greater freedoms. They still need to be scooped up when they fall apart, sometimes peer, appearing much younger and responded to with interest and curiosity when, they're, when they propose ideas or question things. The usual fluctuations in mood capabilities of adolescents, sorry, the usual fluctuations in the mood and capabilities of adolescents demand much from parents including attunement to their feelings, openness to their novel ideas and opinions, patience and time, and very importantly, flexibility to adjust to the choices that their young people make. But trying to do this during two years of lockdowns created a shock a mismatch between the normal developmental tasks of adolescents and a sudden change in the demands of civil society. Teenagers and young people and their parents had been used to their increasing freedom of movement with their peers, testing their ideas, developing their sense of self with, refer with reference to each other in stark contrast to the communal demand of health of, sorry, of public health officials to sacrifice much for the good of the most vulnerable in the community. The developmental tasks of adolescents to compare themselves with their peers and to explore the breadth of social and intellectual life clashed with the overwhelming imperative, the societal demand to stay at home with family. 
confinement. Clearly, amidst all this tumult, the developmental tasks of teenagers had not changed, but their environment had changed radically and suddenly. I'm going to reflect now on just some of the societal changes as they impacted family and school life with some reflections about the impacts on psychosocial and intellectual development of adolescents and associated challenges for parents. And I'd just like to acknowledge here um, my one of my mentors, Dr. Suzanne Dean, um, with whom I have discussed. She was she supported me through the through um, the pandemic, and we discussed some of these things over and over. And I appreciate the opportunity to um, to share some of our musings during the lockdown period. Social life was affected by needing to communicate via screens, which is qualitatively different to being in the same place together. Via screens, there is the illusion of eye contact, but there is a malalignment between the camera and the facial picture, so there is no eye contact. Facial expressions are muted and distorted by the limitations of resolution. Bodily gestures are cropped by the frame. Physical proximity was changed. And relying on screens for contact meant that the data available to teenagers and young people was also changed, affecting how they referenced each other and their self-identity. The social context in which contact took place was also different. Instead of meeting at a variety of places across the week, at each other's houses, school, sport, in the park or a shopping centre, contact was being made bedroom to bedroom, including for school, in some ways more intimate, but also more distant. Of course, we don't know the impacts of these and other changes. I'm highlighting just a few that have struck me and invite people to speak about what you've noticed in our discussion later. The dramatic, the dramatic change in how we conducted social life prompted me to consider physical proximity as it relates to human development and our sense of human connectedness. From a psychological perspective, we understand that secure attachment, our fundamental sense of security, begins in infancy in a very physical way, with physical eye contact, sorry, with physical contact and direct eye gaze. This modifies during childhood and again during adolescence and early childhood, as Claire was talking about. Indeed, physical, physicality of proximity remains very important to adults across the lifespan. We know how deprived people felt of the physical presence of family um, members and loved ones across state borders, which shut overnight. We saw people physically rush to each other at any opportunity. Physical proximity is critical to the psychological connection between people. Similarly, we saw the importance of physical proximity for families when a member was dying in hospital or a nursing home and the associated deprivation deeply felt when this was mediated by, by screens. Families provide the secure base from which adolescents explore the world and come back to rest, be affirmed, test their ideas. During the lockdown period, everyone was at home all the time with significant impacts on family process. It seemed that the secure-based phenomenon was intensified. The challenges people had in their intimate relationships were soon revealed and people were required to find new ways to manage disagreements, conflicts, and in some instances, to protect children. Parents were forced to find ways to navigate this 
very intensified experience of family life, even a polarising experience for some families. At the same time, grandparents, aunts, uncles, cousins, family, friends, sometimes the mediators of differences within families were shut out, resulting in much anguish and deprivation for all involved. Turning to intellectual development, an important change that occurs during adolescent development is the consolidation of the frontal lobe. From about 12 or 14 years of age, teenagers are able to reason, solve problems and challenge ideas in a new way. Their capacity for conceptual reasoning and abstract thought takes off. During the lockdown period, adolescents were deprived of many, many sources of input. So much of the outside world was denied and instead was streamed in virtually via the internet. So much had to be absorbed um, via reading and via screens. Anyone who finds reading difficult or prefers to receive information orally through the ears really suffered. Some adolescents on the autism spectrum found looking at the two-dimensional image very difficult, confronted with multiple faces all at this, on the same plane. Um, can be overwhelming and is radically different. Uh, it's a radically different experience to sitting in a classroom, looking at the backs of peers' heads and with them all separated in space. Some could not learn in this format and so missed a lot of learning or withdrew from school with significant consequences. Now, mid-2022, post-lockdowns, we're being asked to make sense of two different realities. Some might say an experience of cognitive dissonance. On the one hand, the pandemic is still going. And on the other, restrictions are easing. We don't know where this is going to take us. A lot of parents will be struggling with how to cope with this, not only for themselves, but how to help their adolescent and young person adjust to life living in a global pandemic with all its associated risks, disruptions and existential challenges. The task for us all has been and remains to adapt, to adapt in a context of great uncertainty, no simple task, including for young people when we reflect on their developmental tasks. While many children and adolescents are adapting, some are struggling with more severe mental illness, sorry, with, with more severe mental illness, including anxiety, depression, or eating disorders, psychosis. Some here tonight will know that the already overstretched psychiatry and mental health services, as Claire said, are very difficult to access. Some teenagers and their families would benefit from seeing professional, but the community resources that are needed to support adolescents and their families at this time are not forthcoming at the moment. Ben has asked me to talk a little about parent therapy. One of my very favorite things to do is to think together with parents about their child or young person. Parents can do a lot to support their teenager without the child even seeing a mental health professional or in parallel with their child seeing a therapist. In child-focused parent therapy, we think about real life situations that have happened from the teenager's point of view. We wonder together. We wonder together about what they might have been thinking and feeling in different situations and then brainstorm what they might need from their parent or parents in that sort of situation if it happened again. In my experience, when we do this in the calm of the therapy room over and over, thinking about different real life situations that have happened, parents are able to better imagine the perspective of their child or adolescent and respond in a more thoughtful and helpful way in the heat of the moment. 
as I said, I do appreciate that there are limited options, even for people with serious psychiatric illness. And I feel deeply for anyone listening who is having difficulty seeking ongoing professional services. For parents thinking, what now? My teenager is back at school or uni or in work, trying to find a job or at a bit of a loose end. I would encourage you to stay connected with your child, show curiosity and interest in what they're interested in. Listen and interact with their ideas, musings, worries, grievances. Listen and inquire. Hear your child's experiences and try to be flexible in approaching possibilities. An adolescent who is struggling now at school, for example, might do well to do VCE over three years or to transfer to VCAL, sometimes requiring parents to manage their associated feelings of disappointment and loss of their own dreams for their child. Remember the bigger picture. If you can support your child well enough to remaining meaningful occupation, whatever that is, even if it's a few mornings a week, and in a peer group, they will likely be in a much better position in five years' time finding their way. Be aware of your own stress levels and emotional arousal, because if these are too high, we can't attune to the other person because the neurotransmitters from our limbic system deep in our brains back here, the emotion centre of the brain, literally flood our frontal lobe and stop us thinking. Create the space to think together with your child and with your child's other parent or someone who loves and knows them well. Reflect on what you are each noticing and wonder together what your child or young person might be feeling, thinking and needing as a way of opening your mind to a broader range of possibilities. Create space to hear your teenagers' experiences over the last two years. Listen to their reflections, inquire further. Think of it as an ongoing conversation. Perhaps even ask your children what you were like over the last two years. <laughs> Thanks, Jacinta, for that very wise advice that comes from all your great experience that you have. Um, now I will um, introduce our final speaker for tonight. Um, find it. So it's Deb Mountjoy. Um, from National Family, she is the National Family and Friends Clinical Advisor for Headspace. Deb uh, is a family therapist with extensive experience as a counsellor, supervisor and trainer in the trauma field. Deb is passionate about the relational approach working with young people and their families. Deb has worked at Headspace for over two years supporting family inclusive practice in the clinical care of young people and family participation in service improvement. Thanks, Deb. Thank you, Ben. And I'd like to express my appreciation of Jacinta and Claire's presentations. Um, despite um, us not sharing notes, I think that there's huge resonance with our messages and we didn't share notes. So um, it's really lovely that Yes, there's um, some shared understanding about adolescent mental health. So, first of all, um, as Ben said, I work at Headspace, supporting and promoting family inclusive practice. And it might be helpful to just unpack what I mean by family, because it might be biological family, nuclear family, it might be extended family. It may mean friends, significant friends. It might mean community elders. It might be a partner. Um, it might be another adult that plays a significant role in a young person's life. So chosen family or their tribe. And so that's what I mean. It's a very encompassing term when I, when I talk about family. And I want to talk tonight 
it's a slightly different angle, but it absolutely, as I said, um, resonates with the previous speakers. This angle, I think, is about the role of family and the importance of valuing the role of family in the lives of adolescent people experiencing mental health challenges. I'm sure that there's people in the audience who are family, who identify as being family and who have their own lived experience of supporting young people who have mental health challenges. I bring my professional knowledge and experience and also I'm a mother of two, so that informs my professional life and understanding as well. First, I'll begin by thinking about the particularly the professional services provided to young people and the role that family may play in supporting young people. And a bit of my story um, to share with you, which might make sense, is that I originally started my professional life as a youth worker. And I was definitely on the side of the young person and was fiercely protective of that relationship. This was my client and probably had a fairly arrogant idea that this was a privileged relationship and possibly viewed parents or family with a bit of suspicion. I wasn't a parent at that stage. But what happened is that I studied family therapy and so I didn't change teams, but it actually enhanced my understanding of working with young people. And so from from studying family therapy and then practicing as a family therapist for many years, I'm now in the position of um, working at Headspace National, which is really the support unit that's supporting those practitioners in the field who are doing the direct work with young people. And mental health, I think it's fair to say that historically has been very individually focused. So there is still a big challenge, I think, for professionals and for young people and for families to value the role of families in the support of young people. I'm just going to grab some water, just one moment. <laughs> Thank you. So I'd like to make a disclaimer at the beginning to say that including families in the care of young people is not always the safest thing to do. So it's not like any family um, necessarily needs to be involved in the care of young people. And I acknowledge I've worked in the, the area of um, sexual assault and family violence, and I understand that it is not always appropriate. And yet in the majority of cases, it's possible and it's valuable. And I'm thinking particularly about what it means to go into a formal setting, a therapeutic setting as a family member and what those benefits might be. And for me, in studying family therapy and then practicing, what changed was not that I became an advocate for family, but that it, I strongly believe that it is in the young person's best interests to involve those support people in their lives. So it is a different model changing from a one-to-one -one relationship that's considered sacrosanct, or I considered it and, and many have and do, to valuing the role of family and seeing family as a resource and to enhance the care that might be offered. Many benefits, and primarily it's benefits for the young people that, that motivated me. It's considering all things family, that support network are usually in the day-to-day -day support of a young, pe young person. There's physical proximity and emotional proximity, availability, and family can, will be there in the long haul in a way that a professional will not. It's a very limited, time-limited window of opportunity to work professionally with a young person. They are usually enduring connections that go far beyond the counselling room and the brief contact that professionals will have. And so it's a shared approach too, which can only be beneficial for a young person. It's a bit like the right hand knowing what the right, left hand is doing and working together. So for a young person, there's not a split or a separate um, or divided approach to their care and support. The benefits for the practitioner 
clinician, GP, um, psychotherapist. It's sharing the responsibility, which actually can be a relief to be engaging with, connecting with, and including other people that can be resourceful. There's awareness of what the family may bring. They can provide context, background information, knowledge and insight about the young person and will know the young person in a context that is different to a therapeutic situation. And benefits for the family. So family do benefit from information and knowledge about mental health and can learn mental health literacy so that they can engage and have a conversation with their young person about what they're experiencing. The clinician's knowledge and insight can help a family understand. They may understand their young person from a slightly different perspective because of the clinician's understanding of the young person. And there may be support for the family that may be struggling. The family may be distressed, confused or worried. So fortunately, there is a shift. There has been a shift in mental health services from the individual approach to a more family inclusive approach. And this has been evident in significant reports such as the Productivity Commission report, the Victorian, Victorian Royal Commission into Mental Health, where families are acknowledged and the need to support the support system for those with mental health issues. It's been articulated and funding has been made more available for a more inclusive, holistic approach. One of the concerns often raised is about confidentiality and family inclusive practice. What does that mean about the young person's right to confidentiality and privacy? And we could talk for a long time about this, but just want to emphasise that it is still possible to hold the young person's needs in mind at front and centre of the conversations and the care, but to negotiate confidentiality, what is shared and what is not shared in the therapeutic space. Headspace did some research in 2020 on the impact of COVID on young people, and it's, it reflects some of the stats that have been shared tonight. But this was with young people attending Headspace centres. 75% of young people reported a negative effect, sorry, a negative impact on their mood during COVID. 65% of young people reported a negative impact on their study or work situation. It was not mental illness as such, but the effects of COVID, as others have said tonight, it's about disruption to those developmental milestones, disruption to study, disruption to work and social connection. 90% of young people said that they spoke to either family or friends during COVID to help them manage the impacts of COVID. And 82% who talked to family said that they found it helpful. Talking to family was the most frequently reported coping strategy. So in thinking about what Claire mentioned before about the, the task of individuating from family is absolutely essential, an essential developmental task. And yet we can sometimes lose sight of the need to remain connected, for young people to remain connected with those people, those primary carers. And yes, it's changed and it's different. But it's interesting that these stats say 90% talk to family or friends. And actually the breakdown is that fa it was family first that young people went to and then their friends. Perhaps a surprising stat. And I think it emphasises that we as human beings are wired to connect and young people are wired to connect to their friends and their peers, but also to those that they live with and those that, they, that have raised them and those that they will turn to when life is tough. Family is in the one, well, they're one of the groups of people that are in the best position to support. 
And what does that support look like? And Jacinta has spoken a bit about the parent sessions, which, you know, absolutely spot on, I think, around what parents need, what they're craving, and what works with young people. It may be facilitating contact with a professional service. And at Headspace, we have a family and friends reference, national reference group, and we also have a youth reference group. Recently, we had a mother from that, a woman from that group who was mother to somebody who had a young person who'd come through the youth reference group. And they spoke to early graduates about their experience in the mental health system. They were so insightful and honest and brave, I think, in sharing their experience. And the mother spoke about needing to step in when her daughter was not able to advocate for herself. She was very unwell. And I was curious to hear from the daughter about what that was like, because we need to support young people to have a voice and to have agency in their own lives. But this mother was saying, I needed to go to the professionals and say, can you please listen to me? Because I know my daughter and I know she's needing support. She spoke about some of the unhelpful responses that she received. And she spoke about what was hopeful, uh, sorry, helpful and hopeful. And then when her daughter spoke, she spoke about not being able to speak for herself at that time when she was unwell and being in, indebted, I was going to say, grateful for her mother's voice and her fierceness in having professionals listen to what was happening. So facilitating contact with professionals. Or it may be that the young person is not actually seeking or accessing professional support. So it might be those informal, everyday, helpful things that family can do. Having the conversation that makes the difference. Encouraging the young person to express their feelings. Not fixing or jumping into solutions, but acknowledging, reflecting, what you understand the young person's experienced. Supporting the young person to follow through with simple strategies that make a big difference. It's about connecting with friends. Some of those things that have been disrupted or stalled, connecting with friends, finding pathways to work or study or something that's meaningful, activities that bring pleasure and joy and purpose so that there's a reason to get up each day. Activities that support self-care, and Jacinta mentioned eating and sleeping. And it sounds like, of course, these basic habits uh, have profound impacts and COVID disrupted those things that we take for granted. So it is about re-establishing good routines and healthy eating, sleeping habits. Encouraging young people to manage change. And yes, resilience, I agree, is a, it's bandied around and possibly misused or misunderstood. But I think family do play a role in supporting young people to acknowledge what is happening, to build skills, emotional awareness, expressing emotions and problem solving, flexible thinking, managing disappointment and loss. And there's been lots of disappointment and loss during COVID. And what can family do for themselves? Because it's a tough ride, I think, for many family members or support people who are worried and concerned about a young person. And probably one of the most challenging things to do is actually manage their own anxiety because it produces anxiety and keeps people awake at night. Managing that, not going to the worst case scenario, but actually finding ways of um, discovering calm and practicing calm and conveying that when relating to the young person. Seeking their own support, and maybe that's professional support or maybe it's the extended family or the, the tribe, um, close friends that you can rely on and share the worry with. Practicing self-care, 
again, it's self-care. We talk about it all the time. To actually practice it in a very intentional way sustains family members in the long haul. And I really want to underline how important it is. And it's modelling to young people about how to look after themselves. I want to just close by emphasising the need for family to recognise the value of your role and not to underestimate your role. Because if 90% of young people are going to family, they can't all be wrong. There is something about that enduring relationship and, the, um, and what family offers that means something to young people and makes a difference. I'll end on that note. Thank you. Thanks very much for that, Deb. Um, it, it's, it was great to hear about some of the, uh, the work that you do at the Headspace, particularly the insights from the adolescents. Um, and I'd like to invite the three speakers up um, to join me up here for the panel discussion now. Um, so just a reminder to everyone here and online that um, you can put your questions in the, the Slido app um, and um, we'll ask the panel about them. Um, so just to start off, um, we've talked a lot about um, tonight how difficult the pandemic was for um, a lot of young people. but have you guys seen um, kids that have bounced back really well and sort of doing like a lot better in recent months with the um, restrictions being eased and things things going back to a bit of um, normality? I'm, I'm happy to talk to that to yeah. start with. Um, for many, yes. The good news is absolutely yes. Um, it's been fantastic to hear about school plays again and basketball teams. Um, it's been f wonderful to hear people planning birthday parties. Um, and it, it, in some ways, um, there are some young people who were suffering in a kind of a day-to-day, -day, I, I, I don't know how I'm gonna get to tomorrow point, who are now kind of, it's, it's almost like it was a bad dream. So there are some who are just have have been able to kind of um, re-engage really really well and I think that that's fantastic. Um, there was I think a whole new wave of difficulties in school reopening um, that anyone working professionally with young people that created a whole new anxiety. Um, late last year term one of this year the school refusal rates were higher than ever. There was a, um, a lot of young people who didn't have a great experience to go back to or that transition felt too big. Um, and um, we're still dealing with that. And I think that that is now tapering is my, I don't know that for sure, but my clinical experience would tell me that is now tapering and that some of the, it, it's returning to pre, more like previous rates of school anxiety, I think. Um, so yeah, in, in, by and large, I'm just uh, very happy, very relieved to see that um, lots of people are, are coming through this really, really well even ones who've suffered very badly. Mm. Does anyone else want to No. Um, I've got a question from Slido, which is, what do you recommend parents do to support young people who are refusing to go to school due to anxiety? I think that's a pretty common problem at the moment. Mm. Do you want to speak to that? Oh, I mean, I'd, I'd just say um, sometimes you've got to think about the end game. <laughs> you you do have to kind of pick pick your daily battles. Try not to have too many battles, um, but just look, just think about what what you actually want for that young person. Both Deb and Jacinta spoke about the words meaningful occupation. 
think about, sometimes I really like with a family when they are able to kind of show all, all bets are off. If you're, we okay, school's off the table if that's what it needs to be for now. We'll, we'll take, we'll, we'll do whatever it actually takes to show you that your, your well-being is more important than anything else. Um, but then it has to kind of be with that idea that nobody gets well and, um, and has that meaningful occupation that actually leads to recovery and good mental health by sitting at home alone in their room. So it's kind of, it's okay for you to make really big decisions like leave school, do something different, think about education um, out, out in a different way. Um, uh, in a non-mainstream school or in a TAFE or think about employment. Um, just take it all off the table and say what actually makes you happy at that later end of schooling. But when it's kind of not negotiable around that and we're back in the earlier years, it, 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 it does just kind of need to be about some gentleness, have meetings with the school, think about making sure schools are fantastic at, at being flexible with this, I find, nowadays, and saying, we want to do what actually works. Mm -hmm. They can make timetables that are around what, what young people actually engage with, come to school for that bit. They meet young people, amazing teachers out there who are meeting young people at gates each day just to kind of meet them at the gate and say, well, meet you here again tomorrow, or walking, walking them around school grounds before school begins, and amazing things. So talk to the school when you're feeling at a loss about what they might suggest. And um, if it get, if it, it's a really, really important part of a young person's journey to be, have, have that right to education. So if it's getting really stuck, you need professionals involved as well. Yeah. That would be my thoughts on it. Great answer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If it's, if it's, if the usual things haven't helped the child get back, I think by now, it's important to seek professional help, notwithstanding it's very difficult to, to find it. Because the underlying, school refusal is not just, uh, it's not just school refusal equals this is the solution. What is to be understood is the child's experience, their, their what it is that's keeping them at home. Are they, are they needing to stay at home? Are they wanting to stay at home for some reason? Or is it that they don't want to go to school? Or is it that they are so depressed that they can't get out of bed? There's lots of different reasons why someone might not be going to school and that's to be understood. I think that flexibility of, of thinking from parents is really important because um, I really feel for kids that are doing year 12 this year because it's sort of like, I think in the previous two years that it was sort of that understanding that they were, um, you know, that this was a different year and that um, there were reasons that, um, you know, you may not be able to achieve what you wanted uh, in that context. But this year it's almost like it's, some people are forgetting what's happened and that it's all back to normal and you should just be functioning at your normal level. But it's not. We have, yeah. We've had two years of shutdown. I think a lot of people on lockdowns are conflating the words lockdowns or shutdowns and pandemic. We've had two years of lockdowns and we're still in a pandemic. And I think it is helpful to think of many of these challenges as transitions. So it's not just a, well, it's lockdown and now you're back at school, it's black and white, but it is a process and it might be a process that involves others and is negotiated and it's baby steps, um, but it is, it's not necessarily back to normal, and I think that's the point you're making, Ben. Mm. Mm. Um. It will never be the same again. Mm. The world, my life, your life, the community is never going to be the same again. Mm. Yeah, the new normal. <laughs> yeah, for um, got another question now. Um, is it really fair to be talking about the mental health of young people when what's really worrying us is climate change, being un unable to afford a house, etc.? Well, 
in intricately um, yeah. connected, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, one sense of secure. I wonder if this person is talking about uh, when they look forward to the future, um, they see a lot of existential crises. Um, um, and they, they, they wonder about whether there will be a planet to live on in 50 years time um, or 30 years time. Um, these are really big questions and um, they're very worthy of us all thinking about with young people. Um, we should be hearing their experiences about this. Um, it was, it wasn't, it, it's not, it wasn't that, it's not that much different to the, the fear that um, some gen generations grew up with of the, um, the, the Cold War, that the, the world was going to end with a nuclear explosion any time. It's the same sort of existential threat um, that we need to be engaging with our, children, with our um, young people about. And, you know, uh, one, you know, if people are thinking what, what can they, what, uh, you know, what, an antidote to this can be, um, you know, action. You know, if you've got a young person who wants to get out there and protest or tell politicians how to change the law or all that sort of thing, you know, that, that sense of agency really helps our sense of um, well-being. So it's, it's, it's worth, you know, um, in, you know, going with your children <laughs> on their protests to keep them safe. I think, I think someone mentioned that, that um, the pandemic did give us more time from, away from all this busyness and time to reflect and think. And I think um, some adolescents would have been sitting there trying to do remote learning and thinking, what's the point of all this? And um, yeah, that, that I think I'm really interested how that could have actually been a, a creative time for some kids in, in their thinking. Because before it's so, like life's full of you know, school and then you've got your extracurricular activities and everyone's racing around and just that, that time to, um, where, where you had time to, to think, I think in some ways had some value. Mm. Mm. Um, there's a question, do you agree that some people, some young people might experience fear, anxiety of going to school or fear of leaving home for a specific reason? And I think that's what Jacinta, you were saying that there is a time for seeking specific help about and, and really finding out what that specific reason is from a professional. Um, but does, it, does anyone have any, anything else about specific reasons for fear of, of going to school or leaving home? I think particularly when we're talking about young people, we're talking about um, just the, the, the way that um, a young person's developing ideas, their brain is literally just connect, 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 put this with that and learn and this is my new experience and this is so, it, it's, it's formative years stuff. And during formative years, the message was the world's not safe. Close the door. Don't go out. Don't touch people. Don't touch anything. Keep a mask on. Um, and we don't know what's around the corner. There's an invisible threat. Um, it's very hard, uh, us as adults who kind of had... Um, you know, our brains are on the other side. <laughs> so they're doing less and less connecting, unfortunately. We've got to work at that. But, um, you know, we've had formative years of making all our connections about what the world means. So we didn't have to go through the idea of forming through threat in the same way. And I think that's really hard. So I think young people who are now finding it really scary to be at school, they might not, it might not be a germ phobia. I'm not talking about a COVID phobia. I'm talking about they have been wired in fear. And so there is fear that might not actually be easy to kind of say it's this thing, it's that thing, it's the other thing, but a heightened sense of anxiety and fear is a bit pervasive. And I am seeing that, that young pe the, the what ifs have gone through the roof for some young people and it's, uh, it's feeling scary to walk out the door. It makes sense to me that that might be the case. Hmm. 
Um, if we have any questions from the audience here, just put up your hand and um, Bella has a, a microphone for you if you'd like to ask. Um, another question, do you have any ideas for parents around supporting an adolescent in, in brackets 20 plus with borderline personality disorder? I think it is important to note that there's no, well, I mean, eventually there is an age limit to adolescence, I guess, but, um, you know, it does go into the 20s for, mm. for a, lot of, a lot of people. Yeah, 25. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Um, yes, this, um, so family support for a young person with borderline personality disorder, I think is extremely important. And I think the issues that Deb were raising are really pertinent where there is a young person experiencing borderline personality disorder. Um, for those who don't know what borderline personality disorder is, it's um, difficult, it's, uh, it's a relational problem. It's a relational difficulty when um, the person feels um, abandoned or rejected and that could be from what might be perceived by other people as something small but a, f a feeling of um, rejection um, means that uh, is so distressing for the person that they become dysregulated and can't manage their their experience of it and so they quite often um, are experienced um, by other people as being um, on a bit of an emotional roller coaster. Um, um, the, this this um, um, response, um, people with borderline personality disorder um, do very well in very good um, therapy programs and supported by therapy you know support programs with their families. These programs are very light on the ground. Um, and um, yeah, I think good professional intervention is required and sadly there's, there's not enough around. Are you thinking about dialectic behavioural therapy programs? Possibly, or mm. mentalisation based therapy, um, individual therapy, it's, it's, it's different things for different people but in the first instance a very good assessment um, um, from a clinical psychologist or a psychiatrist who are particularly trained um, to assess and um, provide intervention for people with personality disorders. Um, and then there are um, programs in, uh, as you, uh, group programs in some of the public mental health services and the private hospitals. Mm -hmm. yeah. I will just add to that and say that one of the best books I have read as a resource for parents or family support people is called Walking on Eggshells. Mm. I can't tell you the author. Do you know the author? It's so good. It's so readable and it just makes sense. And because um, some of the behaviours that come out of someone feeling abandoned are, are, are quite difficult mm. to live with um, and to connect with the person, but it's really about encouraging parents or family members to remain connected in some ways and possibly set some boundaries around the difficult behaviour but um, understand that the person's really needing to feel loved. Mm -hmm. And so this, this book is a very well written book and plain English and practical. The other resource um, is uh, Spectrum, mm -hmm. S-P-E-C-T-R-U-M, Spectrum. It's the statewide uh, public uh, mental health service um, for uh, specialising in providing resources, a very little amount of service, but resources um, for uh, around personality disorders. So I would um, encourage people to, to Google that. They have a lot of um, resources on their website. Um, yeah. I'll add to that as well. Just, it's interesting that you mentioned Spectrum because the mother that I was speaking about before, um, she, without giving away names, she's actually um, working at Spectrum as a support person for f supporting family and the lived experience of family supporting someone with borderline personality disorder. So it's, it's interesting that we've, we're talking about that and, and the role of family and her role particularly. I was going to say that, that 
getting care for yourself as a carer is, is one of the most important things because if you're not able to be there to support them, um, it's a bit like the putting the oxygen mask on yourself before your child um, in an aeroplane. Yes. Stop walking on eggshells, and one is walking on eggshells. Oh. <laughs> Do we know which one? What? Who are the authors? Uh, good question. Um, Jane Paul T T Mason is stop walking on eggshells, and the other one is Jane. Did you say Jane? I say. I, say. I think it's. Oh. Do you know? No, no, no. <laughs> That's. Uh, I think it's in Australian books. Okay. Okay. There's actually three. There's another one for parents. Stop walking on eggshells for parents. Yeah, I'm sorry, I can't be more decisive <laughs> about that. It was a while ago that I read it. That's okay, thank you. I've got a really good question here. How do you approach a teenager who sees your inquiry and concern as intrusion? For example, poor eating, sleeping or exercise? Mm -hmm. Timing is everything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. Yes, that's very, very, very difficult. Um, but I think, like, the way I think about this is if we can have balloons or kites in our mind about things we might want to talk with our child about and be very astute about when one does it. Um, it, it doesn't matter who we're talking to, if the person isn't able to receive it, what is the point of starting the conversation? It's not the right time. There's, um, there's someone within the trauma world called Dan Hughes, who mm. I'm a massive fan of, and um, he does a whole lot of talks for uh, often foster carers in the US who are dealing with kids with, um, who've been through a lot of trauma and are very, very difficult to work with. And I remember watching this one video of him doing a talk for foster parents, and he was saying, okay, imagine this scenario, child comes through the door and they slam down their school bag and they say, get the F away from me and slam their door. And that was how they came home from school. So you could approach them politely about the swearing and the throwing of the bag and the slamming of the doors and say, look, this isn't how we do things here. You could get really mad about it. Come out here, young man, pick up that bag. Or you could go in and say, you must have had the worst day and just try and see what happens if you open something up. Um, I don't know what you need, but you, maybe you need a hug, maybe you need to come and sit and have a, a snack. We need to talk, I reckon, because that sounds awful. Um, and I would liken that to the sleep and the, the same thing. So if you're saying, you need to get to bed tonight, um, look, I'm a parent, I'm guilty of that voice. I know it well, you can hear it, it comes out of me really naturally. Um, but, you know, we all do it. But it's not ideal if you actually stop and reflect and don't do the, you need to get to bed at a better time tonight or see this is why in the morning, this is, see, you're so tired, I keep telling you about sleep. That's just going whoop, you're, you're communicating, but you're not actually reaching each other at all. So I would think about coming at it a little bit differently. Like, I think you look like you're really tired. Did you sleep well last night? Did you have a good night's sleep? What time do you reckon you are getting to sleep? Oh, it must be so hard to do your schoolwork if you, it, mu it must actually be really, really hard to get through your mornings if you're that tired. Just come at it differently from a point of empathy and validation and see if you can get change and buy-in from, yeah, I am tired. Because then, wow, you've just, you know, the, you met each other, your brains met each other on an agreed point that, yeah, you're both tired, you know, you, he is tired. So now you've got something to talk about. Not, no, I'm not, I'm not, get, I'm not doing what you say. Oh, you oh, yeah, I was go. just going to say, um, uh, um, Dan Hughes and Jan Balin um, have written a fantastic book called brain-based brain parenting, mm -hmm. which we'd probably both recommend. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and Dan Siegel, he's, yep. he's got a book on, um, I won't remember the title of that, I was hoping that you would. He, he's, what, uh, he's got Parenting the Teenage Brain. Oh, I don't, so I have something teenage like one. He's got one mm. on positive 
discipline, I think. Right. I don't like that the word discipline's in it, but it's actually but a good book. Is it called No Drama Discipline? No Drama Discipline, that's ah. the one. Thank you. Thanks, Dan Jane. Siegel. So he's written a lot of stuff for very much tailored to young, young people's brain development and, and mood and um, books for parents as well. So anyone could Google his name. Oh, yeah. I was just wondering, um, both as a parent oh, and someone sorry. who Oh, sorry. Could we... Um, oh, sorry. Because then the online audience can hear your question. I was just wondering, um, as both a parent and someone that works in the mental health sector, what you foresee being the big issues that we should be um, looking out for and if there's anything in particular you think we should be... Um, yeah, keeping an eye out for over the next even five to ten, you know, if, if there's anything you see or in your research you know of that they're talking about foreseeing in young people, it's always on my mind how is this impacting them, not just in the next year but in the next five to ten years even. I think that's a really good point. I, um, I don't think we know the answer to it. Mm. And um, actually in... in chatting to Jacinta and Ben, I was, I'd come from an optometrist appointment during the week where my optometrist said to me that there's been a threefold increase in the rates of prescription glasses for children and that it's not screens like everyone thinks it is, it's decreased amounts of sunlight mm -hmm. and that we actually know from other countries who've already, for other reasons other than a pandemic, been through children having decreased amounts of sunlight, like pollution um, or high density living or um, more dangerous areas, that the, we, we know the generational effect of that. We know that that leads to increased rates of macular degeneration later in life. Um, and so we've, we've kind of got that coming for us in Australia. And it got me thinking, well, if, if we're talking about these mental health threefold increase kind of effects or 70% more presentations of suicide and self-harm to ED in, in that six week period, or what, what have we got coming around the generational effect of that increased mental health difficulty, that kind of um, shared trauma? And I don't know um, is, is the only obvious answer to say, I guess in some ways, but. I would say that we can probably learn from times where there have been other generational trauma impacts and um, how, as a group, that can actually... There, there are some people who are vulnerable and actually need specific help following that, but as a group, it can actually be a unifying experience of something that's difficult that kind of, you know, the kids of the pandemic in some ways, that kind of actually becomes a formative experience that people go through with and incorporate into themselves a sense of self and not always in a negative way. Mm -hmm. That's the only thought I can have on it as a generation, but... Um, yeah, I find it a really interesting question to, mm -hmm. to ponder and we're all sitting with not knowing. Um, but it will be, I th from a psychological point of view, I think it, would be, it will be really interesting to see what these young people make of it in, in, a, in a really profound way, because then that will inform how, you know, it will inform how they parent. It will inform the decisions that the leaders make. It will, a bit, a bit like, you know, the, the depression. Um, and, the, and the, the war, you know, there was such deprivation and then there was a whole generation of, of um, parents who desperately wanted something very different for their children. So a very needy generation, you know, then we had a baby boomer generation. Yeah. <laughs> it's very interesting. Abundance, yep. Yeah. In the Headspace survey that I was talking about before, 41% uh, of young people said that they had more empathy because of COVID, mm -hmm. empathy for others. Yeah, it was, it was a lovely stat actually because it was as expected, there were lots of negative effects and yet there were some positives that came out of it. Um, a similar stat said that they felt c closer to their family and of course, there's some instances where the intensity actually was really difficult for families, but others felt closer because of that. They became, I guess, more connected around activities and, you know, in that sort of 
more insular but protected environment. So there have been some positives that have come out of that, whether that's long lasting, whether that shapes a new generation, I'm not sure. I don't think we should underestimate how much children and adolescents and young people understood why we were doing this. They understood exactly why we were, we were doing this, all the ones I spoke to, and they, they went along with it. Um, so, so there's not a problem of them not understanding or knowing or being part of a community endeavour. Mm. You did mention screens. Claire, and I know in in South Korea they have a like I think uh, an internet addiction kind of problem, and uh, I'm sure gaming addiction, and um, and I I do wonder myself. I don't have any sort of research about this about the effect of that time spent with virtual reality and artificial intelligence and interacting in that in that way. I don't really know what what to make of it, but. Um, do you see that in your practice much? Like kids that are just pretty much addicted to being on a screen and... Yeah, I do. I do see, um, and I think that is, ex that is extreme, not a norm. I'm not, gonna, I'm not saying all teenagers are addicted to their screens. I do say to parents, you've got to remember that um, you were addicted to talking to your friends after school too. And you used to make phone calls to them and you know, you, little sister would pick up the phone in the other room and you'd hear the click, <laughs> um, you know, and, and your parents would have to say, that's enough time on the phone, hang it up, come and join your family for dinner, what, and you need to do homework, whatever it might be. It's just a new way of having a developmentally normal step in some ways. I think gaming is also a new way of having a, a, something pleasurable and enjoyable that you do and, and often, um, with other people that they're relating with as well. Yeah. It's actually not solo social, for a lot of kids. Yeah. It's quite social. Yeah. Um, the, the one thing I guess that is of concern about gaming in particular is games are um, wired to be addictive. They are made to keep people playing them. Um, and that is really problematic because they're lighting up all these reward centres within your brain and flooding your brain with dopamine someone comes along and goes, that's enough, turn that off. And it's kind of like this rapid pulling out of all of the plugs of that. And it's actually going to flip rages. And I do, it actually will be a kind of a chemical rage that will happen when it's kind of, no, you've been on there long enough. And yet, you know, the five minute countdowns haven't worked and all of those things. So it, there are difficulties when, when gaming doesn't have really clear boundaries and expectations and Discussions. Those boundaries and expectations don't have to be, this is what I'm telling you it is. It's a discussion about what's reasonable. Um, it's amazing how often kids can tell you pretty, pretty accurate things about what might be reasonable in terms of being on the internet. You know, they can give you a pretty reasonable number and you go, well, yeah, that does sound reasonable. So rather than enforcing it, kind of negotiating it. Um, yeah, and there's extreme examples of when people are quite addicted and those those neurons are set off by that gaming and it's at the expense of other things. Mm -hmm. um, Felicity? Hello, hello. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Pretend you're a um, rock star. Awesome. <laughs> I'm um, Felicity Dent, I'm a GP. Um, from Inner West in Melbourne. I've been working in the Inner West for years and years. Um, and I'd like to start by saying thank you for your, for your words, but mainly you guys for your, your work. It's such important work. And as health professionals, I feel like in the last two years, I've never been as proud of what we collectively do. Like, yeah, I think, I think it's been hard and I think we've done a good job. Um, so yeah, being a GP has been extraordinarily challenging in the last couple of years, um, but it's also been fascinating and has been a privilege to kind of walk with people. But um, I think as GPs, one of the things that we have noticed probably before and more than anybody is the trends that have happened. And so, you know, we have noticed occupational groups that have been affected more, age groups, transitional groups, whatever. Um, and one of the things that I've really noticed is that probably second only to health professionals, the occupational group I think that I've seen that's been 
the most distressed have been teachers. Um, and I just wonder, so I wonder how they're doing because I think they're, they're, um, they're dealing with lots of distressed adolescents and also being a mum, so I've got two adolescents and one almost adolescent, from the school we're kind of getting a lot of information about um, distress from the point of view that they're having staff shortages and stuff but no mention of mental health. Um, and I do wonder whether you're aware of any kind of um, acknowledgement of teachers and their mental health or anything that might be happening to help them out. I'm not. I said before, Felicity, poor GPs, poor teachers mm. as well. Long-standing um, kind of holding of things. And I've got, I've got um, teachers within my own family and so I know how hard they work. They are... I think there might be a culture of just get on with it that probably contributes uh, negatively to teachers needing to kind of just up and keep going. Maybe that's why there hasn't been kind of much of a look at, at the staff mental health. Um, I would, I, the teachers that I know of, I, I don't know that that's been addressed within the schools that they're in. And I think it is really important because they have, they worked so hard. I mean, I think, um, the programs they were putting together and the way they were having to get through kids through educational hurdles and attending and switching on their their devices and attuning to something it's so artificial. Um, they worked really hard and uh, are still working hard now with the school anxiety and, and kids not coping with being in school. So yeah, it's, um, I don't know of anything. I'd just like to say, some, um there's, there's, there's the micro things like training in, in, in schools and having things available, but um, I, th I think one of the things we've seen in the pandemic is how, you know, the fa if the fabric of society has cracks in it, um, when we get a bit wobbly, the, there isn't enough to hold us. And a lot of the... Um, the fabric that we had in our society that held together, held people together in terms of their security was employment, like having a secure job. Secure jobs, secure housing is fundamental to our mental health and well-being. Many, what's the percentage of teachers on contracts now? It is enormous. Um, and it's across many, many, many sectors. And I think right now, uh, I, I actually think that there would be less mental illness, way less mental illness, if we could fix some of these structural problems in our society. It's no surprise to me that we have an epidemic of anxiety even before COVID. So if there are policy makers listening, <laughs> politicians listening, please, you know, continuity, reliability in our income so that we can look after ourselves, look mm -hmm. after our families, security of a roof over our head are fundamental for everybody. Mm -hmm. It goes back to one of the earlier questions about young people being mm. stressed about how am I going to be able to buy a house. Mm. Housing and employment and it's nothing's predictable or stable and of course that creates anxiety. Mm. It makes sense. It's a normal, it's a reasonable response mm. to the mm. unpredictability. Yes, because it's dangerous, it's unsafe. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Um, we have a, a GP here that sort of responded to what Felicity said that teachers are really distressed and that GP is seeing heaps of them, so, yeah. Um, we have a question for Debbie. Uh, how do families and young people access Headspace services for young people who need professional help? So there's 150 Headspace centres in Australia and um, I'm not sure how many in Victoria, but it is about ringing a Headspace centre, your local Headspace centre, so it's a matter of Googling Headspace and um, ringing and asking for an appointment. So a family member can do that, a young person can do that. Um, wait lists vary, wait times vary. Um, it, it's very mixed um, at the moment. Most Headspace centres, there's a huge demand because of what we've heard and particularly in COVID, there's been a greater demand. 
Um, but yeah, it's or or it could be a referral referral from another professional. It could be a GP making the referral as well. Yeah. And I'll add in that Headspace have brought in an initiative around trying to prioritise on wait lists kids from, um, from government schools because there's a recognition that private schools have um, a little, sometimes a little bit more in the way of the, um, the counselling departments. And um, I was really pleased in my sunshine role referring a child to Headspace the other day that they said they could see them, um, I think it was two weeks. And I thought, okay, that, that's really reassuring because um, it's such a fantastic service to have young people be able to be bolt build, walking off the street for um, a, 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 the ability to kind of talk to someone and see, have, have a bit of an intake process around what, what they might be able to access. Um, and they were, like everything, um, when, when a system's overloaded, it just, can't work through that immediately. And so headspaces were overloaded. The waits were really, really long, but that, that was really reassuring um, the, other, the other day to hear a child could get an appointment in a couple of weeks. The other thing that's often not known about headspace centres is that there is a pathway to work and study. So it's a whole program and support for meeting with a young person um, to clarify what, what their aspirations are, what they love doing, what they are interested in and supporting them to find meaningful occupation. So it's, you can request that, you can ask about work and study and there would be a, a link to somebody that can offer that support. I'm not sure if, it, if they have an age limit but the um, PHNs, which are the primary health networks, also have head to health hubs now that um, that provide, uh, they've had a, a lot of funding and have additional services, so that's another one to have a look at. Um, and care in mind, who are doing telehealth uh, free uh, res assessments and treatment. Yeah. On the telehealth, um, you were talking about um, was it, yeah, Jacinta, you were talking about the eye contact. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I'm into technology a bit, so there is technology coming that has the camera behind the screen. I'm not sure whether they'll be able to create proper eye contact by knowing where the eyes are, but <laughs> even then, I'm not sure because it's a right brain to right brain yeah. interaction, I'm not sure if that will actually do, do the same thing as being in person, so. It's very interesting, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, it was terrific that we had this technology. I, I, I'm not, like, I'm, it was absolutely terrific, but thinking about the impacts is very interesting. And I actually had better experiences when people had a better camera and better mm. internet speed and it was really clear. Yeah. I, I found that really yes. kind of quite different to if someone had a sort of a, a blurry kind of image. And, yeah. and from here in Spotswood, <laughs> it's terrible. Mm -hmm. yeah. But then again, there was also some patients where actually doing it on the phone without the video was amazing. It was almost like psychoanalytic psychotherapy where oh, they're on the couch. On the phone, <laughs> so, on the phone was fabulous, particularly yeah. if people had um, noise cancelling earphones mm. because it was like being in a little cocoon. Yeah. yeah, so I think sometimes yeah. taking away some of that and mm. focusing on what people are saying can... So it's different for everyone. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we've got a f time for um, one more question. Um, can I ask a question? Yes. That would be better. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, I'm Star and I work for the Salvation Army and I work with a lot of adolescents. And um, we've been talking tonight about how hard it is for some of them to access services that they need, professional mental health services. So in that time when they're waiting, for some reason they can't, don't, won't go to a professional mental health service, what would you recommend that they can get involved in, other things that they can access that can assist them with, um, you know, 
keeping healthy while they're waiting to access those other more professional services. Do you mean programs or just activities programs, informal? Activities, um, yeah, yeah. What's something that I could provide that can yeah. help kids who can't get into, get into a service? Um, my son actually had to wait a, a little while to see a psychologist um, and the GP um, that we see at Altona, and I don't know, Felicity, you might know of this, but there's a, I think it comes out of Sydney Hospital and it's called This Way Up. And the GP can sign up to it and then refer their young people, patients to it. And it's an online program and it's like a self-paced program that they can take themselves through. So he was able to do that mm. in the interim while waiting mm. for, for help. Mm. Is it? Yeah. Oh, well, the program was called This Way Up. Yeah. Yeah. Can I just go back to your question? I think it's a really important question that... Quite often as workers, it, when the resources are less than thin on the ground, we can feel really resourceless. Um, and, I, you know, I would... Uh, the question you ask, I can't answer because I, I think it's um, idiosyncratic to every single person. Um, so I would, I would really encourage you to, to seek supervision um, if you have a particular person in mind that, that you're thinking this question on. Yeah, I think that um, if you absolutely can't access individual services or even group services, that any activity that has sort of a care of, of people in mind and interest in their sort of inner world, whether it's like, I know, uh, things like equine therapy and pet therapy. I mean, they might be difficult to access too, but if there are any kind of um, programs like from the local councils that have been part of a group as um, their goal, then I think that's, that can only help. But I mean, it's not a substitute for getting a proper assessment as well. When I heard your question, I th immediately thought of the phrase, it takes a village to raise a child. And I think it is about connecting with those other people that can be resources. And it might be, it might be a pet actually, and it might be a cousin, or it might be, you know, not someone necessarily in the immediate family, but it's um, just thinking creatively about who does my young person respond to, have a connection with, or enjoy hanging out with, um, what, and sometimes it is somebody much older, you know, it might be a grandparent. So, so that was where I first went, thinking about who can you, how can you galvanise the support system around that young person? But the other, which Felicity um, reminded me of, eHeadspace is a digital mental health service and it, people, young people can be anonymous actually and they can um, relate to somebody there's group chats, regular group chats, where they can connect with others or they can have a one-to-one -one support, not a session, but a conversation with a clinician through eHeadspace. And the group chats are clinically facilitated, yeah. so there's safety within that as well. I think it's worth mentioning the Black Dog Institute. So they're, they're, yeah, they, their thing is online mental health. So you can go to the Black Dog Institute website and they will go through all the available online mental health options and you can pick the appropriate thing for your particular person. Yeah. All right, so we've run out of time for tonight. I'd like to thank our three brilliant speakers. I think they deserve a round of applause. <laughs> and um, thanks everyone for attending both in person and online. Um, you can give feedback about the forum via the QR code on the page um, and you'll also get an email uh, after the session uh, with a link to a recording of the session um, and that'll also have the feedback code um, as well. We've also got um, two more of these forums coming up um, through the same registration page um, and we'll also post up some resources related to tonight's talk um, on the page. So thanks for coming and have a safe trip home. Thanks. Thanks.